Today we will discuss an ECG showing pre-excitation and discuss about the different types of re-entrant tachycardias which can occur in WPW syndrome. You know that uh, the accessory pathways in WPW syndrome are situated along the atrioventricular annulus that is the mitral annulus and tricuspid annulus. There are several pathways uh, like lateral, postroceptal. So several pathways are there along the annuli of the mitral and tricuspid valve. And uh, we will not go into the details of localization of pathways but we will discuss about the two types of tachycardias which can occur in WPW syndrome. This ECG shows sinus bradycardia with a rate of around 50 per minute. In addition, you can note that the PR interval is short. Short PR interval followed by a delta wave. This region is called the delta wave due to pre-excitation. The shape of this region resembles the Greek letter delta as well as a river delta. So that's why it is called delta wave. You can see the delta waves in all leads and short PR interval also. Sometimes there could be a difference. Here it appears like a small R and a S wave. But that is also due to the delta wave. In the different leads manifestations will be different. Here it looks like almost like a pathological Q wave of myocardial infarction. But actually that is not a pathological Q wave of myocardial infarction or inferior wall infarction. In these two leads though there is an apparent similarity. These are known as pseudo infarction Q waves in WPW syndrome. Here it is like a slurred wave over here. You can see a slurred delta wave over here. So these are the important findings seen in this ECG. Delta wave, short PR interval and sinus bradycardia is also the pseudo infarction pattern is the due to the apparent Q waves in lead 3. Then this could also resemble left bundle branch block because at one look you might think that this is left bundle branch with a wide QRS and a R wave in lead 1. Here also if it was a little more prominent delta you could mistake it for left bundle branch block. So WPW syndrome can be mistaken for infarction bundle branch block and since the voltage is high you may think of left ventricular hypertrophy also because you can see a tall R wave here. Similarly there is a tall R wave in V1 also you might think it is right ventricular hypertrophy. So it can mimic hypertrophy, infarction and whole lots of things. But uh, you have to be carefully looking for the PR interval. Here the PR interval may appear to be near normal that is because part of the delta is isoelectric. Here it is lesser. Here it is also lesser. So you have to look at multiple leads to decide the PR interval. Otherwise you might miss part of the QRS which is isoelectric and think that the PR interval is normal. Now we will move on to the types of tachycardias which can occur in WPW syndrome. There are two types orthodromic and andidromic that is atrioventricular reentrant tachycardias and still another form is WPW syndrome patients are also prone for pre-excitation related atrial fibrillation. So they can develop atrial fibrillation with a very fast ventricular rate which will result in a tachycardia simulating ventricular tachycardia at a very high rate. But there will be irregularities. This is the mechanism of narrow QRS tachycardia or orthodromic tachycardia which occurs in WPW syndrome. This is the commonest form of atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia which occurs in WPW syndrome. It is narrow QRS because ventricular activation is through the conduction system. That is an appropriately timed atrial ectopic and can get conducted through the normal atrioventricular pathway and 
when it reaches the atrium back through the accessory pathway it can get conducted back to the ventricle again so this circus movement or reentrant circuit is what causes the atrioventricular tachycardia of the orthodromic variety so in orthodromic variety the qrs complex is narrow it will look just like the other type of atrioventricular tachycardias like uh, uh, av nodal reentrant tachycardia from the ecg it may not be easy to differentiate though there are some subtle points but then uh, there is uh, no way of differentiating routinely because when the patient comes to the emergency department what will we do is we will give adenosine adenosine will block the conduction through the av node even it, if it is verapamil also it will block the conduction through the av node transiently and then this tachycardia circuit will break after the tachycardia has stopped you have to take a routine ecg this is a must for any person being treated with tachycardia otherwise you will not be able to pick up underlying abnormalities like wpw syndrome in post conversion ecg it will be easy to identify the wpw syndrome but during tachycardia it is narrow qrs and you won't be able to identify delta wave or short pr level nothing will be possible during tachycardia so that's why we always say in any tachycardia even if it is ventricular tachycardia you have to take an ecg after conversion because sometimes a myocardial infarction patient can also present with ventricular tachycardia so if you don't take uh, ecg an ecg after conversion we will miss myocardial infarction in case of myocardial infarction it could be also scar related re and re which presents later that is old myocardial infarction presenting with ventricular tachycardia so it is mandatory to take an ecg after converting the tachycardia especially in wpw syndrome where you will not be able to identify wpw syndrome or pre excitation in the tachycardia ecg as almost 90% of the tachycardias are narrow qrs with activation through the normal av conduction system that's why it becomes a narrow qrs tachycardia patients with wpw syndrome may also develop a wide qrs tachycardia when there is ventricular activation through an accessory pathway instead of through the normal av nodal conduction system this is antidromic tachycardia initial activation occurs through the accessory pathway and ventricle is activated in this direction most of the activation occurs through the muscle and not through the conduction system and uh, this will produce a wide qrs tachycardia and the impulses can also enter the av conduction system for retrograde conduction as the retrograde conduction is through the av conduction system it is known as antidromic against the conduction normal conduction in the av conduction system is downwards so when it is going retrograde it is known as antidromic tachycardia dromos means conduction so in this case there will be wide qrs tachycardia and when the person presents to the emergency department you have no way of differentiating it you will think it is ventricular tachycardia and usually when there is hemodynamic compromise you will cardioward the patient with a direct current shock and after the shock when you take an ecg you will find that there is pre excitation evidence of pre excitation as we discussed in the beginning with short pr interval and delta y so it is almost a retrospective diagnosis most often for wide qrs tachycardia with ventricular activation through accessory pathway for antidromic tachycardia this is much rarer than the orthodromic variety which we discussed earlier maybe about 10% of the cases of tachycardias in atrioventricular tachycardia that is the wpw syndrome we have antidromic tachycardia
This is a much rarer form of tachycardia which occurs in WPW syndrome. It is atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome. At one look, it looks like a ventricular tachycardia because of the wide QRS and a fast rate. But if you carefully look, there is change in the RR interval. Almost 50% difference you can note if you calculate the shortest RR interval and the longest RR interval. You have to be carefully looking at the different RR interval. This is the this is a short RR interval and this is a long RR interval. Such gross difference in RR interval will never occur in ventricular tachycardia. So that indicates the underlying rhythm as WPW syndrome. In atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome, the tachycardia impulses travel down through the AV node as well as through the accessory pathway. That's why you have a fast rate. And another peculiarity of accessory pathway is that when the rate increases, that is the use dependence, when the number of impulses coming is more, the refractory period comes down. That is why it is possible to conduct at a very high rate in atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome. For the usual normal AV pathway, what happens is that when the rate increases, the AV conduction, the number of impulses conducted down decreases. That's why in usual atrial fibrillation, you do not have very high rates of the range of 300. This is almost in the range of 300 if you take this R interval. Not exactly 300 but less. But even near 300 heart rates can occur, ventricular rates can occur in atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome. And this cannot be maintained for a long time so that it will degenerate. It may degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation in the presence of WPW syndrome is a very dangerous arrhythmia. They usually present with hemodynamic compromise. And of course, in the emergency department, they will be promptly cardioverted. And uh, you will not may, uh, wait for other modes of rate control and all. You will just cardiovert. And when cardioverted, and then you take an ECG, you will be able to identify the axillary pathway or WPW pattern.